When Disney Channel announced that the Cheetah Girls One World would be the third installment in their hit girl group franchise, fans couldn't help but notice that just like in the wild, our cheetahs were experiencing a troubling population decline. And the reason is exactly the same. They're being hunted down by poachers, one by one. Not really. Actually, there are varying stories about why Raven Simonier did not join the cast for this movie, or the group's first non-soundtrack album, or the party's just begun tour a year before that. Whew, sorry, I swear I don't actually care that much, but I haven't been able to say anything righteously indignant all day, and for some reason my brain is really latching onto this. And you'll be right there with me after watching 90 minutes of some very familiar Cheetah Girl story beats, such as unrealistic routes to stardom, petty fights, and sleepy songs, but now with a Bollywood twist that helps romanticize the country of India, while also cementing a good number of stereotypes without even realizing it. Yep, sounds like a new millennium Disney Channel movie to me in another cheetalicious installment of Clip Breakdown. Watch. Hello, television viewers. My name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content here on the web, and we break it into pieces like a set list at a show full of teenage girls. So we can look at each individual clip as though it were the stanza of a ballad and say, this one wins an Emmy or a Tony or a Grammy, and that one goes in the meat grinder with all the other dead cheetahs at the zoo. And uh, mama, this whole movie is a big dead cheetah to me. Like it is a rotting carcass that I hate. <laughs> I've grown to really dislike the Cheetah Girls movies because the second one was so boring. Like I liked the first one. And then this third one is the same as the second one, just a different country. I, I cannot, but we'll get into it. Before we do though, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more decom musical clip breakdowns like this. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know. When it's feeding time at the zoo, mama, and we're throwing some gristle at your cage, it's so hot. I had to turn off the air conditioning, obviously, to shoot this, and I'm just like, it's a lot. So if I'm shining in this video, <laughs> that's just the way it is. But my glow could never compare to the shiny faces of our cheetah girls who start out this film in a sort of dream sequence where they're making a music video in their minds. This girl is a French I can tell just from those introductions that Adrian Bylon Houghton was getting the highest pay rate out of all of the Cheetah Girls. Why else would they let her have more fun with the melody and give her 30% bigger hair? If things were truly equal, they should all be wearing too much eyeliner right now. Even just lyrically, things don't feel equal. Aqua and Dorinda started that song like, I am such a good friend, I am so loyal. And then Chanel steps up like, and I just wanna party. Let's go do a bump in the gender neutral restroom. As you'll notice, I'm still away from my usual home right now and being away has made me realize, mama, sleep is very important to me. And at home, I am living the dream thanks to Helix Sleep, the sponsor of today's video. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are custom fit to your needs and then shipped right to your door. Helix clearly knows that everybody's different. That's why they made their sleep quiz. It matches your unique body type and preferences to make the perfect mattress for you. You can even take the quiz with your sleep partner and find something that's right for both of you. Helix matched me with the Midnight Lux mattress with Glaciotex cooling cover. I know I'm a side sleeper through and through and <gasps> I run hot at night. Helix delivers your mattress anywhere in the US for free. It comes rolled up in a super easy box. It like popped out of there and suddenly I have a new mattress. This mattress makes my whole body feel so cradled and supported. You can see in the B-roll, I was genuinely shocked when I first laid down. You get a 100 night sleep trial along with a 10 year warranty and there are even financing options and flexible payment plans. You get more than three months to use this mattress and make sure that you love it. If you don't, Helix will pick it up for you and send you a full refund. I love my Helix and I think you will too. If you're looking for a new bed, click the link below or go to helixsleep.com 
slash Duranio for up to $200 off your Helix Sleep mattress plus two free pillows. Thanks Helix for sponsoring this video and bringing me the sleep of my dreams. Now let's see what these cheetahs are up to. What they're, they're gonna put me to sleep too. We pull out, we see a whole dance number that kind of shows off the bigger scale and budget of this movie, which shot on location in Mumbai, India for three months in 2007. Of course, it doesn't take long for us to realize that no, the cheetah girls haven't actually reached international fame. This is just in their imaginations while they're auditioning for an agent who might represent them. This has me confused because I feel like every movie has the cheetah girls finish by being in some contest that puts them on a national stage. And then the very next movie, they're struggling to get birthday party gigs. Like, why are you not start fucking Twitter or something? Kind of rough. Well, we're still working out the king. Yeah, we used to be a foursome. But then Galleria got into Cambridge. Which you know is great and amazing. Especially <laughs> considering her study habits. That's why she's in summer school. That guy's like, uh, I don't see how your friend bribing her way into Cambridge with bad grades explains why you are all a half beat behind on your choreography, but okay. That's a wrap on Raven Simone and the Cheetah Girls franchise, I guess. It's definitely not due to behind the scenes arguments and power struggles between her and the other Cheetah Girls, obviously, because that would not be very girl power. The Cheetah Girls would never let anything come between their friendships, except for in every movie. This whole scene is basically exposition to get us caught up on who and who is not in the new movie. I'll give you a hint. Almost no one from the other movies, like the parents are not in it, and just devoid of a lot of characters. Aqua is like intentionally breaking her computer because she likes flirting with the tech support guy, Kevin347 that she keeps calling. Meanwhile, Dorinda, I forgot she even got a boyfriend in Spain in the last movie, but she's like, the long distance relationship was too hard. Phone bills, blah, blah, blah. Remember, Dorinda is the poor one and she won't let you forget it. <laughs> So the girls are going out to an Indian restaurant to discuss their next move. And Dorinda sees something interesting on the wall. I see you've met Ganesh. The statue is known as the remover of obstacles. Can he also be known as the remover of Dorinda's hat? Because that is visually my biggest obstacle right now in terms of enjoying this movie. She looked at that statue as though she thought there was a real elephant with human hands eating at the next table. She's like, I don't mean to stare, but that's a little weird. In my culture, statues are of normal things, like a skinny guy in a loincloth who's nailed to a board, bleeding in agony. Anyway, can you just bring me an order of that thing that I always get, the Chicka Ticka Mancala or whatever? You know, the cheeky tiki marsala. Just get the normal thing. I did not try Indian food for the first time until I was 16. I know, New Hampshire. And I was like, oh, this is good. There are other countries of food besides chi burger? <laughs> chi burger. Anyway, the girls are kind of ready to give up on the cheetah girl dream because they have like two months until they have to start college and no record deals are on the way. So it seems, it seems unlikely right now. And Chanel is like, you guys don't really want to give up, do you? I don't want it to end. Me either. Well, it's now or never, so let's make it now. Look, I promise from now on, I will stay so focused, nothing will get in our way. I think if there's one thing we know by now, it's that the Cheetah Girls need to stop making such uh, confident declarations at the beginning of all their adventures, because it seems like that only triggers the opposite to happen. Friends forever. Forever. Do you seriously not hear yourself foreshadowing the third act conflict with these unkeepable promises? Friends forever, but you're both going to die one day. Then what? We don't know. Like I said, after the first movie, these Cheetah Girl sequels become dreadfully formulaic to the point where now they set up these we're gonna be fighting soon subplots as though it's their catchphrase. And whatever happened to them just randomly using the word cheetah before certain adjectives? That was at least slightly less cheetah annoying. See, it still sucks. So presumably because that statue of Ganesh removed an obstacle, suddenly Chanel gets a call out of nowhere that a movie producer wants them to audition for a big Hollywood movie is what she hears. So the girls are reinvigorated by this new opportunity and they're like, we have to get this. And they start dancing with the whole restaurant. I would be like, I wanted more non, not your ass in my face, mama. 
Don't worry, girl. Everyone almost drops a tray with four spoons on it sometimes. But me helping you pick it up is feminism. Although when I don't tip you later because of the mistake, it will be capitalism. That's just something I can't help you with. Dig a little deeper. I do like that song because I was using it as motivation last night when I was getting this video ready and I was like, I can hate this. I was like, I'm just gonna dig a little deeper <laughs> and keep going. So I dug my sharpened spoon deeper into my thigh and that gave me the drive to keep going. Just kidding, don't self harm. So that outdoor restaurant montage, which clearly uses the same dancers as the dream sequence. Can you see the ice pack I have in my lap, by the way? It is, again, what it is. The dancers from the dream sequence and the dancers at the restaurant are clearly the same people in the same costumes, just with like an added vest. But I'm not too bothered by a lot of those details because one thing they do accomplish in this movie is big, large scale dance numbers that are well shot. And this number transitions seamlessly into the finish of the girls auditioning for this director. His name is Vikram or Vic, and he's directing the movie, which is called Namaste Bombay. And then he's like, no, 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 I didn't say a Hollywood movie. I said Bollywood movie. And she's like, but you said in the biggest production country on earth. And he's like, yeah, that's India. And they're like, okay, we're not going then because it's not America. <laughs> and then, so they go off to the side and Chanel kind of explains to them, like, this could be it, guys. And again, we have this scene in every single movie where they get an opportunity and all of the girls are like, I don't know, I have to teach dance lessons. And they're like, do you want to fucking be a professional singer or not? Every time we get a goddamn job, you guys want to act like prom is more important. Jesus, can you tell that I really don't like these girls anymore? <laughs> the friendship has soured. I think Raven was the only one keeping me hooked. She brought a lot of charisma and unique like kind of personality to the cast that I'm not saying Chanel, Aqua, and Dorinda don't have, but it's definitely not coming at me in spades the way that Raven Simonier was able to do. So after some convincing, the girls are like, okay, fine. Then they're off on the adventure of a lifetime. That was Christopher Columbus and his crew as they sailed directly for North America. And the rest, as they say, was a f nightmare. You can tell right off the bat that the girls seem <laughs> a little mentally unprepared for good old India. Ah, it's gonna be so good to get out of New York for the summer. I know, the heat and all that crazy traffic. I'm sorry, you girls are about to graduate high school. Have you not even heard of India before? And you're telling me the least well-read person in your group got accepted to Cambridge and already Camila Cabello'd herself? I guess the Cheetah Girls didn't really have to consider the temperature of their destination when packing because it seems as though they all like to layer four to five tank tops, camisoles, and mini jackets every day, regardless of climate. I would need a shower squeegee to be getting the under boob sweat under control on that plane ride. My sweating has finally decided to stop. I just needed to sit still and put an ice pack on my lap, <laughs> turns out. Pretty common stereotype I'm realizing with how American movies portray the country of India is that kind of quintessential, we landed and there's chaos and it's dusty and hot, which is, mm, I don't think a fair representation of every part of the country. But either way, that's where Dorinda is and she's already starting to notice some interesting mystical happenings. She's like, look, it's the guy from your restaurant. Is he like your mascot? Hold on, everyone. Dorinda just got broken up with, so her new thing is being Eliza Thornberry. We've literally only been in India for half an hour, but she made eye contact with an elephant, so she's Buddhist now. The girls get to stay at a really fancy hotel, and then later they're shopping in the town square. Miss, come here. Thank you so much. Come. I'm sorry to bother you, but I have to ask, are you Hermione Granger? I swear I've seen more people in white shirts and tuxedo vests in this movie than at a national show choir competition. She looks like early Avril Lavigne after a very long international flight. And if you're wondering how this Swami knew that Dorinda was passing by with his eyes closed, the answer is mystical Hindu wish magic, which is the generous sponsor of all of the good fortune these girls are about to experience. Apparently India is a place where you can just you like have wishes come true. We're even uh, like, I guess it's good that the movie is giving representation to Hindu as a religion, but it kind of feels like these American girls are just adopting some of the rituals and reaping the benefits without actually practicing or even really being that interested to ask questions. Take the string and tie it in the tree. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's colorful, but 
I think there's enough strings in this tree. Oh really? And how the fuck would you know? You think you can just tell people how many strings need to be in their tree because you're the only one out here wearing a business suit? She didn't even ask what the tree strings were for. She just flat out refused to participate in anything so whimsical. They're not party decorations, girl. He's trying to teach you something. So he says, oh no, you put the string in a tree while making a wish. And then when your wish comes true, you remove it. So all three girls are like, we could use a little wish magic right now. We'll appropriate this. <laughs> no, but he asked them to, so it's fine. He's just helping them out. So the girls are all happy that they made the decision to come to India, blah, blah, blah. So next the girls head to the movie set for their first dance rehearsal where they meet Rahim. He's the leading man of this Bollywood movie, which is called Namaste Bombay. He has women and girls fawning for him because he's been in so many romantic Bollywood films, but we can tell that he's a little bit of a dork in his private life. Then the girls meet with Gita, who is the choreographer of the movie, who doesn't seem super impressed by the Cheetah Girls at first. Hey ladies, I can't spend half my day chasing after- Hi Raheem! Oh! Oh! That's Gita, she's a choreographer. Oh. She's a choreographer? Yes, and it seems like she's having some sort of medical emergency over there, so maybe stop talking and go roll her on her side or something. Although both Gita and Rahim are slapstick clown clumsy, I think their bigger challenge will be learning how to recover in a more dignified way. <laughs> what kind of science fiction swine flu? I think that actor is having a hard time making his snorts seem involuntary because he is currently looking into that beautiful woman's eyes with a full moon crazy face and squealing like a pig, boy. I just realized, I think I saw the movie Deliverance too early in life. Oh well, I've been trying and it turns out that snorting while laughing in a way that sounds accidental is actually harder than it seems. I think you would kind of want it to be like, <laughs> <laughs> like that, like it's coming out. He does it like, <laughs> uh, anyway, that's probably enough of me making those noises and facial expressions on my channel until I die. Only because I think it's causing the sores in the back of my throat to open up. Are they allergies or oral gonorrhea? I don't know. And neither does the CVS cashier who I made take a look. So Gita gives them a quick rundown of the Bollywood dance. She literally whips it out. She's like, doo, 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 doo. can you do that? And they're like, um, not without you breaking it down for us. And it goes into this song called Dance Me If You Can, which I'm like, dance me if you can? Dance me if you can? Dance me. And regardless of that title, I do like this dance number. It gives us these big sweeping shots across large groups of dancers. And the song is basically Gita telling the girls that they will never be able to learn her choreography. Although I think that would just mean she's a bad choreographer. But in any case, the Cheetah Girls show that they can handle her moves. There's really no chance that you can do a dance. Yes, we love to see women supporting other women with each other's asses. This movie wants to act like it invented the concept of combining hip hop beats with East Asian music, which is culturally and creatively disrespectful to the song Buttons by Pussycat Dolls. Ooh. I'm telling you to loose it. I didn't know that song was referring to buttons like on your shirt for the first two years it was out. I thought they were like pressing each other's buttons, like loosen my button on an elevator, making me horny. <laughs> That's what I thought she meant. I needed to think smaller. Oh, back in the auditorium, right after the girls auditioned, there was some assistant who was like, your uncle, the producer only wants you to hire one girl and you just hired three. And he's like, I'll figure it out later. I wish we didn't have that because then when they go and meet the uncle in India, he says the same thing. He's like, you're not all three supposed to be here. You're supposed to be one person. I think that would have been a better reveal if they had saved it, but just scrap the whole movie if you really want to save it, save my time. So yeah, they revealed that plot point a little too early. I think it would have felt more like, why did we come all the way here? And no one told us this. So the girls go talk to Vic, the director, and they're like, you totally misrepresented this to us. We're out. I gave up my college prep course for this, even though we could have probably done that online. And they go on a long walk at night while singing a song, literally disrupting a parade. One reason why this movie feels so boring is because so many of the musical numbers are just them walking down different pathways. Is this a musical or are we playing shoots and 
and ladders, mama. So the next day the girls are shopping, which is like their main activity. And they're like, you know, they said that we all three would have to audition for the lead role, but maybe we should think about it. Any one of us could do this, you know, it could be a big opportunity. That's when, what's her name? Aqua gets a call from Kevin347, her phone potty. They've just been talking through the hotline and this is the first time he's called her. And she's like, I'm in India, I'm looking at the sunset. And he's like, I am too. You're watching the sunset too? We're in the same time zone. Uh, there's this beautiful temple. With white carved elephants? That's right. To me, it seems way too convenient, and at least a little racist, that Aqua's call center boyfriend is also based in India, but I'm more distracted by the fact that she realized they were in the same time zone and started vaguely describing landmarks to try and narrow it down. Aren't you supposed to be the smart one? Although it worked, and they just happened to be standing right next to each other. So I guess Disney's version of India is just this singular city sidewalk where the girls can go shopping for jewelry. Smells like this representation needs to bake a little bit longer. Ah, oh, damn it. I said I was done snorting on my channel. Whatever. So Kevin reveals that his real name is Amar and blah, blah, blah. You didn't tell me you were coming to India. You didn't tell me you lived in India. Wait, you don't sound like you live in India. Why Aqua? What do people who live in India sound like to you? Let me guess which character from The Simpsons you're thinking of. This is peak early 2000s diversity, where Hollywood is still pumping out the same cultural stereotypes it always has been, but now shot on location. So we're making fun of people from their home territory. Not all Indian people are IT experts or have the same generalized accent, which are two stereotypes I believe a lot of Indian people get frustrated with from the West. Anyway, he he says he doesn't have an accent because he watches a lot of American television. It's like, it could just be because you're a really strong English speaker because your second official language is English and you're the second largest English speaking country in the world. But again, whatever, I don't care. Dorinda sees all this going on and she's like, I'm gonna ruin that for her. Yo, I think we should give our girls some privacy. No, I know how these long distance things end. I'm gonna talk to her. Girl, talk to her after she f**ks this guy on her vacation. Don't be rude. That's basic girls trip cheetah etiquette. Cheetah girls trip cheetah etiquette. A cheetah 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 girls trip cheesy etiquette. Live Connecticut in the lead of it. Sorry, I guess now that the snorting thing has gone out the window, I don't give a f how foolish I look on this channel. Because I've been really professional up until this point, if you watch my past videos. Dorinda keeps seeing like random elephants walking through the town square. I don't know if that's how India really is, but either way, she keeps like looking at elephants and being like, have you noticed that every elephant keeps looking at me? And I'm like, not really, I don't see it. And there's a camera pointing at it. So it's not selling. So Dorinda that night is clearly still feeling a certain type of way about her breakup with her Spanish boyfriend. And she doesn't know where she's going in life. Thankfully, there's a foreign exotic elder with innate wisdom willing to lend her a hand. Don't miss where you are now because you are anxious for the future. But what if I'm afraid of where I'm going? I don't know. Don't ask follow-up questions like I'm Grandmother Willow. I'm a mystical sage stereotype, not your therapist, Blondie. Go touch up those roots. So Amar and Aqua are having a great time spending the day together and getting to know each other. They go out to dinner. She talks about following her dreams and he's like, you should totally go for it with this movie, blah, blah, blah. Dorinda sees how nervous the lead actor Rahim gets around Gita, the choreographer, and tries to help him with his confidence. All of this stuff, like I must have been sleeping through this part. It sucks. Meanwhile, Chanel is talking with the director, Vic, and he's like, this is my one shot to be a great filmmaker. I need this movie to be great. And she's like, well, I know how you feel. Like I really want to be a star and this feels like my last shot too. So girls and boys are all bonding. Isn't that fun? Coupled up, coupled up, coupled up. Vic basically puts it like this. He's like, you should audition for the lead and you shouldn't bow out of this just because of your friendship because this is a once in a lifetime chance. So obviously Chanel has a lot of thinking to do and she does it through song. I already knew the Cheetah Girls were not being given enough blocking back when they had to fill up an entire song by slowly crossing a bridge, but it is triple dipple confirmed with this boring number with a title that I don't care about. All of these songs are so, like there's so many ballads that are very forgettable. And this one is just a montage of Cheetah Girl moments we've seen less than 20 minutes ago, intercut with footage of Chanel, you guessed it, slowly crossing a bridge, but with a little twist to show that she's yearning for less jealous friendships. You can catch that move in this musical montage I made out of her musical montage.
the director said, okay, Adrian, your motivation for this scene is everything is out of reach at the grocery store. Honestly, I would be having the same exact problem in her position. They would be like, do something different with your hands. And I'd be like, you want me to play with my nipples? Set a bouquet of flowers out on that bridge for her to pick up and sniff or something. Set some props out, give her some shit to do. At one point she picks up rice and throws it. It's like, more of that, please. She's walking a lot around this pond being like, mm -hmm, angels, I see angels. So Chanel is thinking about her friends, not sure what to do, but at the end of the song, she sees Vic, this new boy that she has fallen in love with after five seconds. When Gita and Dorinda are out, you guessed it, shopping at the bazaar, it's like, do you guys have enough goddamn bracelets? Gita's like, oh, I could never be a star. I'm more a behind the camera type of person. And Dorinda's like, I see that for you. <laughs> no, she's like, you should be a star. And she talks to Gita about how she's too nervous to go after Raheem, the lead actor, because she doesn't think they're in the same league. And Dorinda could just be like, you know, he likes you just as much, so you should just tell him. She doesn't. She's like, you should go after him. It's like, just tell her. You're all adults. If two people from different conversations told me they wanted to f I would let them know. That's just saving time. There's a song where they're on swan boats. <laughs> That's just about the girls falling in love while Dorinda is a third wheel. I feel like she gets that a lot in these movies. They're like, you can be the bridesmaid, Dorinda. Oh yeah, these songs are really boring. I really don't like this movie. But it's essentially about all the people who are in love yearning for each other. The actor and the choreographer, the director and Chanel, and the phone center guy and Aqua. And then Dorinda with her broken up ass. <laughs> broken up ass, her relationship that failed. It's just me, Dorinda, with my broken ass sitting off to the side. You can tell Dorinda's conflicted in some way because she keeps getting calls from Spain, which means her ex-boyfriend, but she doesn't answer them. So as we get closer to shooting, Vic is really unimpressed with the low quality and production value of his, the set for his big wedding scene, which obviously needs to look opulent and expansive. So he goes to his uncle, who's the producer, and begs for more money, but his uncle's like, mm mm mm. You need to learn some things about how real world works. I went to film school, uncle. NYU. So did I, and I definitely learned how the real world works. For instance, which McDonald's you can buy crystal meth at. It's not an official menu item, by the way. And actually, I don't think that was on the official film school syllabus. It was kind of just something that felt really cinematic to me at the time, you know, because of the drug-induced psychosis. So the uncle is like, whatever, you're shooting on that set, and also, uh, you gotta cut two of these girls, okay? Get two of them out of here, pick one lead. So he's stressing, thinking that his movie's gonna be a flop because of this, and that's when Amar, who is Aqua's call center boyfriend, is like, you should come with me for Holi to visit my family, which is the Festival of Colors. He's like, my town is 10 times more beautiful than any movie set. You can location scout there. You can audition for your lead there, whatever. This doesn't make sense because that actual holiday, I believe, is in the spring, and this movie takes place over summer vacation, but whatever. Yeah, Holi is in March, the end of March, and this is clearly summer. Meanwhile, that Swami is like, girls, you have to take down your strings and they're like, our wish didn't come true yet. But Aqua takes hers down secretly. And I'm like, this string thing might be cool if it had any f***ing point to the plot. When the gang arrives at a Mars family home, they are completely blown away by how huge it is. There's a gigantic dance going on. It's all perfect for the movie. <laughs> Right at me. Uh-oh. Speaking of drug-induced psychosis, I don't know how the filmmakers thought they were going to shoot this so that it looked convincingly like these live-action elephants were going out of their way to look directly at Dorinda. Because from my perspective, it kind of seems like she's the one who always has a staring problem. That elephant is like, um, can I help you? As it turns out, Amar lives in this huge castle, like a palace. And they're like, is this your palace? He's like, no, it's my parents. So obviously, Aqua takes this personally, that he's rich and didn't tell her because that's the worst thing on earth. I'm like, wait, what? what? When would he have said that? You went, you spent one day at an ice cream stand sitting on a beach. Were you just playing a joke on the smart girl who's too dumb to realize you're a, a Maharaja? Okay, I'm sorry, but it doesn't change anything. If anything, it makes my life more difficult. Right, because of all the money and privilege and living in a castle, I think I'm gonna recommend a few memoirs for you to read so you can stop saying stupid 
shit like that. And if he's from some royal Indian family, why was he also working at an offshore call center? Oh, they had to double up on stereotypes for him because every other character was already a Bollywood dancer, street merchant, or Swami. Which, by the way, is a honorific position in the Hindu religion. Vic is very taken with this location and asks Amar if his mother would let them shoot there. Amar's mom is a huge fan of Rahim, the actor, so she's gonna be thrilled. But Amar is like, there will be one condition. And then in the next scene, he tells Aqua, I'm the new location owner, but the only condition was he has to cast you as the lead. So the boys are now in the background trying to get the girl that they're going steady with, like the job. It's a lot. Dorinda sees that Chanel and the director are now a couple, and Dorinda thinks that's her way of trying to get the lead. Meanwhile, the director tells Chanel that Amar said he had to give the role to Aqua, but it's not up to him. He said it's gonna be up to his uncle anyway. So it feels like all of these guys got something to say to these girls that's influencing their decision making. Thought they said they were gonna play fair. Chanel and Vic, maybe she didn't want you to know, but if she gets the part, you would think it was fair. But we promised each other. Seems like you're the only one keeping that promise. Really? Because to me, it seems like all the men in this movie need to shut the fuck up and let me think for a minute. I don't know why the Friends Forever Cheetah Girls are always the first ones to be manipulated into fighting and jealousy, but they need to figure it out because these girls receive a life-changing opportunity at the end of like every movie. And then the next sequel starts and their lives are back to exactly the same. It's the day of the big audition and at this point, none of the girls trust each other. Aqua even heard the director talking with his uncle and it's like Aqua's the best better actor, but Chanel's the better singer, but Dorinda's the better dancer. And I'm like, it sounds like neither of them are that good at all three, so let's find a new person who can do it all. But no, they're about to audition and no one likes it. Did you also wish for your boyfriend to buy your way into the movie? What? I would never. Yeah, spirit. Like you're any better. Coming from the girl who went bad and eyelash at our director. What is the team? Cheetah. Girls are fighting, no! Of course they are. It's only seconds before their big audition. Focus, dedication, professionalism. <laughs> Sorry, you must be thinking of the Cheetah Boys. The Cheetah Girls are the ones who stake their entire brand on not letting anything come between them, only to let basically everything come between them. Oh my God, even the like boys have a song at the uncle where they're like, my girl can do it all. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, that song, it creeped me out. Like it was like, felt like I ate raw garlic when he, when they started singing. And and then the girls do their dance audition. Again, these songs are just so forgettable. Like I think of the other movies and I'm instantly hooked from the first movie on Cinderella. I don't wanna be your Cinderella, waiting in a hot pink dusty cellar or whatever. And then from the second one, the party's just begun, like iconic. I don't, I couldn't sing one of these songs for you, except maybe One World, the one at the end. Okay, there's one, but this, I don't know, I don't know, and I have no interest in showing you. You can go watch it on Disney Plus if you feel like it. There, fair use. I'm not replacing the original work, Disney. You can eat shit. You can take a bowl full of shit and eat it. <laughs> oh, it's hot. It's hot in here. So the audition ends and the uncle is like, congratulations, Chanel. You get it because you're the de facto lead after Raven left. And they're like, who's Raven? He's like, I don't know. So the other girls are like, congrats, congrats. But there's obviously a divide between them because this opportunity has only come to one of them. And the other girls seemingly have to go home now, even though I'm like, still got two strong dancers you could add to the cast. Like, and the movie is still being written. That's what I love. The director keeps being like, all right, I have to go back and do some rewrites. Why don't you have a screenwriter for this? How are you writing a movie while it's already in production and you're directing? Like, it doesn't make sense, but okay. So now all three of the girls go on a musical walkabout with a montage showing why they're friends. And then at the end, they end up holding hands. This is how they solve their conflict here. No, we gotta stick together cause there's no place like us. Aw, those cheetah girls, once again, solving their problems by changing tank tops and singing in different locations for a little bit. That issue resolved itself with the same elegance as my case of hepatitis A. My skin turned yellow and I pissed Coca-Cola brown. Yellow and brown, like a cheetah. See, that's quality writing with my Coca-Cola piss. Coca-Cola piss.
After the girls come back together, Chanel is like, I'm not gonna take the part. Being famous and in a movie is not worth ruining our friendship over. I'm like, it might be, because <laughs> you might not be friends with these girls after you go to college anyway. Take the role. They'll live, like, this is show business, mama. There's only one part. So Chanel tells Vic, and Vic is like, well, if you can't be my leading lady in the movie, maybe you can have the job in real life. I'm like, no thanks, I quit. Next, Amar is apologizing to Aqua for getting them into this mess, and he thanks her for inspiring him to follow Follow his dream and that's why his parents don't think it's such a bad idea for him to move to America to study whatever the f so she's like, yay, we can still, you know, hand job each other. Born to hand job, baby. I'm gonna get a tattoo that says born to hand job right under the snake. Oh, and also in this series of wrapping up, Dorinda gets on the phone with her ex from Spain and is like, I realize we can still be friends. So call me whenever you can and I'll definitely pick up. I'm like, great. We all were so anxious to see this storyline with someone who was never in the movie get developed. Like give Dorinda something real to do maybe. I feel like her character remained sort of an afterthought throughout the entire franchise, but whatever. They're like, who's gonna be in the movie? And then they're like, I think I know just the person. And ta-da, it's Gita, the choreographer who never thought of herself as a star until some other women told her to shut up and just do it. To me, it's like, why couldn't she think of herself as a star? Did she have some injury that she thought would exclude her? What, her appearance? She's gorgeous and young and a great dancer. So to me, and actually Indian. So obviously this would have been a better fit for the Bollywood movie. By the way, Vic's original idea when he cast the three cheetah girls in this movie was to title it American Girls in India, which is just like, I think we all see why that wouldn't have been a good movie. But no, they cast Gita and now it's back to Namaste Bombay. And we get this really fun, definitely the best musical number in the whole movie to One World, which is the title song, obviously. And you can see they did not cheap out on getting professional Bollywood dancers. Not like that last movie we covered, Basmati Blues, where everyone looked like they just saw Slumdog Millionaire and tried to figure it out. So the movie is being shot and it's such a success. The girls are for some reason on top of an elephant. <laughs> Ooh, try to hold on with both hands while you're up there, girls. We could only afford the elephant who has a limp due to his previous stomping rampage. And that's all she wrote for Cheetah Girls 3, One World. And I am so tired of this installment. I honestly hope they never reboot it because to me, it's just, it's a big no. The first movie again was good. I wish they had put more creativity into writing the second two. I'm not sure if the novel series followed the same story structure, but probably not since you know, they lost Raven in this one and suddenly lost a member. But let me know what you think. I know this was a highly requested video because I did the first two and refused to do the final one. So let me know in the comments below as well as what other DCOM original movies I should cover next. Don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more early thousands nostalgia broken down into little clips. Also, most importantly, don't forget to click that subscribe button right over there and turn all your notifications on. That way you're the first one to know when I'm cranking out a new one world, one heart and stomping down the town like an elephant. Also, I've got merch available and a Patreon where we most recently did a live watch party for the Adams Family Values, which was super fun. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for putting your one world and one heart into an elephant with me today. I will see you next time. <laughs>